The cistern that Gaius and Simon are fixing during episode five of season three of The Chosen is actually the key to understanding the entire episode. Now I know what you're thinking. You've got to be kidding me, right? I mean, so much happened in this episode. The healing of Veronica, the resuscitation of Jairus' daughter, Eden's miscarriage. It's easy to see how the events involving Simon and Gaius could almost get lost in all of that. But it's actually this act of repairing the cistern that shows us what we really need to understand about these events. And when we see all of this through the lens of the context, the history, and the scriptural connections of these key moments, well, it will become so much clearer. So if you're interested in seeing those connections and diving even deeper into these events, then join me for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before we dive in, let me take a quick moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Angel Studios. And if you're not familiar with Angel Studios, they're the studio who brought you The Chosen. And now that season three is out and available to everyone, you're definitely gonna wanna download the Angel Studios app. I'm gonna share with you a lot of insights and details today that will make you wanna go back and rewatch every episode of season three. And the Angel Studios app is the place to do that. With the Angel Studios app, you'll be able to enjoy all of the seasons of The Chosen, including the new episodes, on your phone and on every other major streaming device. They even have a TV app on Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, and much more. Another great thing you can do on the app is pay it forward. The Chosen is free because of the generosity of people like you. And the app makes it easy to spread the show to even more people around the world. When you go to the community tab in the app, you can read about the impact that the show's having on people and hear from those who have been blessed because others have paid it forward. And you can also hear from people who have felt led to pay it forward themselves, like Marlene. Hi, everybody. My name's Marlene. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. I came to faith in 1977 despite my Jew anti-Jesus bias. When I first saw ads for The Chosen, I was very skeptical since most Christian movies seem to be pretty hokey. But I got hooked after the first episode and I've been a happy contributor paying it forward. And I think it's an amazing series. It's reaching so many people that wouldn't otherwise be reached. So I hope it continues for another four seasons and God bless you all. When you give, it opens the door for the Lord to change lives through shows like The Chosen and many others that you'll find on the Angel Studios app. So take some time to check out the app and read through the stories of those who are being blessed. And don't forget, you can watch the live premiere of the brand new episode of season three of The Chosen on Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern on the Angel Studios app. You'll find a link down below in the description and up here in the card where you can download the app. And right now, let's dive into our video. Throughout episode five, we are constantly faced with the subject of the value of human life. From Eden's miscarriage to Jairus' daughter's death to Veronica's quality of life, we see many moments where life is valued and where it isn't. And the truth is that this was a very real issue in the first century context in which Jesus lived. In fact, it was a major source of tension between Jews and Romans. In Roman society, some lives mattered and others absolutely didn't. Slaves, prisoners, opposing nations, and even the lives of children were held in low regard. In fact, Gaius himself alludes to this at one point. He tells Peter that one of his children is the child of a former servant, after she died in childbirth, he decided to raise the child as his own. And as he's sharing this, he argues that this was an incredibly benevolent act, given what might have happened to the child if he had not done this. You see, when a child was born, the midwife would present the child to the father, and he would then decide if he was going to accept or reject the child. If he thought that the child would be healthy and a positive addition to the family, then he would embrace the child, thus claiming the child as his own. But if he didn't embrace the child, then the child would literally be put outside and left to die. This was called exposure. In some cases, children would simply starve to death. In others, they would be seized and either sold into slavery or placed in brothels. These were the prospects for the child that Gaius embraced. And so it was truly a benevolent act, not necessarily normal in Roman society. In fact, it was more Jewish than Roman. And even beyond birth, in Roman society, the value of children was understood primarily in terms of what they could contribute to society. People were not mesmerized by the joy and the innocence of children. 
What mattered was how a child could now and eventually add something of benefit to the greater community. In Jewish society, though, things were different. Life was valued very highly at all ages. Jews didn't practice exposure and infanticide. Jewish law actually made provisions for widows and orphans. And as the image of God, human life mattered before birth had even occurred and despite one's productivity. Now, this is not to say that Romans didn't care about their children or that Roman women would not have grieved like Eden. They did have a fundamentally different view of children and human life than Jewish people did. In fact, the Jewish value of life is what leads to something that occurs both in this episode and in scripture that, at least to us, seems incredibly strange. After Jairus' daughter has died, we see that there is a small group of professional mourners playing flutes and wailing inside of the house. An episode is drawing this moment directly from scripture. Mark's gospel recounts it this way, saying, They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And Matthew adds, Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. Now, while this might seem odd and even a bit showy to us, it was not all that uncommon at the time of Jesus. Professional mourners appear throughout scripture. Amos, Ecclesiastes, the death of King Josiah. In fact, this was a practice that appears in other cultures as well. Professional mourners were believed to aid the family in their grief. Women would craft words of lament that would help the family to put their grief into words. They would craft poems to praise the departed. They would incorporate family references into their dirges and speeches. In some cultures, these professional mourners might also prepare the body of the deceased for burial. And in many ways, they were doing then what pastors, churches, and funeral homes do for families now. Pastors and church members will speak and sing to honor the deceased. They will assist the family in their grief, despite how well they knew the deceased themselves. Funeral homes will prepare the body for burial and make arrangements for a service to remember the person who passed. And ultimately, what we see in this episode is the first century Jewish culture's way of helping a family through this traumatic time, of comforting them in their grief and helping them to communicate it and to process it. And again, it's a recognition of the value of life. But as we also see in this episode, some people, even in Jewish culture, didn't feel that their lives were quite as valued as others. In my video on episode four, I talked about why Veronica, the woman with the bleeding condition, was an outcast in society because of this condition. In fact, if you'd like to learn more about this, just click the link up here in the card or down in the description and you can watch the whole video. But the reality is she is not allowed to enter her family's home. She's not supposed to touch anyone in her community. In fact, she's not even supposed to touch Jesus. Can you imagine what that would be like? To not be able to touch anyone, to feel so rejected, so disconnected, to bear such shame. In fact, it's this desperation that leads her to do something incredibly inappropriate. She reaches out and she touches the fringes of Jesus's robe, despite knowing that it will make him a rabbi ritually unclean. But here's the thing. While the situations of Veronica and Jairus' daughter might seem so different, the way that they're treated, their family situations, their conditions, while those things are so different, there are some key similarities that we have to see in order to really understand what's happening here. And the best place to see this is really within the context of Scripture itself. For instance, in Mark's account of these events, he says this, Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now, seen by itself, this might seem like exactly what happened in the episode. But viewed in the context of Mark, this is a much bigger deal. You see, Jairus is a religious leader. And the last time we saw religious leaders in Mark's gospel, they were conspiring against Jesus. But what's more, Mark says that Jairus fell at Jesus' feet. In scripture, this is understood to be a posture of worship. Jairus is bowing before Jesus. This is an incredibly ironic moment, but Mark's not done. Because just as this religious leader has come bowing before Jesus, asking for help for his 12-year-old daughter, 
It says that a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years comes seeking help from Jesus. And she thinks to herself, if I can just touch his cloak, I'll be healed. Now, the part of Jesus's cloak that she wants to touch is called the tzitzit. You see, in the Torah, God commands throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels, tzitzit, on the corners of your garments with a cord of blue on each tassel. You will have the tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord, that you may obey them. So in order to obey this command, Jewish people would attach four fringes to their garments. This is what this woman is touching. And there's more. Because just like Jairus, after the woman touches Jesus, Mark says that she falls at his feet. Just like Jairus, she worships him. And in Mark's gospel, both the woman and Jairus use the same word when asking Jesus for healing. It's the Greek word sozo. But sozo doesn't just mean healed, it also means saved. Both of them are professing that they believe that only Jesus can save them. And this leads us to the cistern. Because in the scenes around the cistern, we hear the message that ties all of this together. As Gaius and Simon are working on this cistern, Simon says that he feels like he's experiencing prophecy unfolding around him. He references a verse from Jeremiah where Jeremiah says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And what we see highlighted here in this verse is a Jewish understanding of the difference between living water and other water. You see, as Simon and Gaius are working, they're using pallets and mortar and other tools to construct and seal their cistern. Now, just in case you're not familiar with this term, a cistern was a vessel constructed to hold water. In Israel, water isn't always abundant. Rain occurs in seasons. In some places, it only rains a few times a year. I mean, even today, Israel only gets about 20 inches of rain per year. And so in order to survive, people would build cisterns to retain the water. When the rains or the floods came, they would divert the water into these cisterns and drink from that water until the next rain came. But naturally, there was a problem with this. Sometimes cisterns would leak or break, like Jeremiah says, or things could get into the cisterns. They could be contaminated by feces or even dead animals, and an entire water supply would be ruined, just like it is in this episode. Cistern water was stagnant. It wasn't fresh. It was easily ruined. It was the total opposite of living water. Living water refers to streams or rivers. It's water that flows and moves. It's always fresh. It's always clean. But there's also another big difference between cisterns and living water. Cisterns are water that we prepare for ourselves, and living water is water that's provided by the Lord. And this is the key to this whole episode. Because what Jeremiah is saying and what Jesus comes to show the people is that they have been living off of cisterns. They become content with cisterns. They're content looking to things other than the Lord for life. Families look to doctors to heal. Mourners are used to address the family's grief. Priests trust ritual baths to cleanse. But these things are all cisterns. And Jesus says, I'm not here to give you more cisterns. Jesus says, I have come to give you living water. Jairus and Veronica, they understand this. They know that the other things will never satisfy, never heal, never do what Jesus can do. All the other things are like broken cisterns promising what they can never deliver. But Jesus is living water. He is the one who truly heals, truly gives life, and he still is. I mean, let me ask you, where in your life are you relying on cisterns? Where are you trusting in things other than Jesus? What are those things? Is it money or power or other people's attention and approval? Are you putting your hope in some leader or some product or some thing that will solve everything? Because in the end, what Jesus says is that those things are all cisterns. They're weak and insufficient, and they're just alternatives to the one who can truly satisfy us the one who is our true savior, the one who offers us living water, Jesus. Well, that's it for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now make sure to click the link up above or down below to download the Angel Studios app so that you can go back and check out all the scenes that I just highlighted. 
And if you're interested in seeing more of my videos on each episode of The Chosen, then just click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.